Very good computer, okay. Welcome everybody to Habitat Now. I'm your host, Aaron Shea, and today is my, uh, our here at Habitat, our Habitat Estate Extravaganza. Welcome you. Um, I'm gonna go over a little bit about what we do and show a little presentation, and we invited uh, Seattle-based photographer, Dan Fox, uh, to join me uh, for this. I'm gonna meet everybody with the magical power of... Uh, How do I get rid of me? And make sure I can unmute Dan. Here we go. Unmute. Cool. Maybe that will work. Unmute. Okay, unmute. You unmute yourself, Dan. It doesn't work. Well, thank you all for coming, and I'm looking forward to uh, talking about Habitat Estates and all of the different services that we offer through Habitat, and show you some beautiful pieces available in the secondary market. It has been a uh, strange couple weeks after COVID. We have the new movement where it's, it's affecting all of us and all of our feelings uh, currently in, in today's society. And I, I want everybody to know that uh, we here at Habitat are standing with everybody and the thoughts that we're supporting everybody having the rights to be who they are and be supported by themselves and being supported by the community. So that being said, I'm gonna start our presentation by taking over the screen and um, looking forward to uh, showing you some beautiful things. So let me figure out, get my presentation ready and Get it going by getting my Zoom screen to share my screen. Here we go. And here we go. All right. So anybody's welcome to unmute themselves at any time during this presentation. And if anybody has any questions at any time, please jump in and uh, ask away. So this is our Habitat uh, Estates Extravaganza talking about the resale market and what kind of services we offer here at Habitat and where the market is overall. So. Um, welcome. I'll start it away. Click this next slide. So the first thing we're noting in, in uh, support of our artists is for every piece sold in the month of June, we're going to make a donation to SURF, um, supporting the artists in, in today's uh, world. A lot of them need our support, and you're welcome to join with me. I uh, put the link on the bottom there, which you probably can't click, but if you Google uh, SURF uh, COVID-19 Response Fund, you can find out how to donate and help artists uh, financially through this uh, great foundation. And we're gonna be doing that too. So I mentioned Dan Fox is our special guest. He's a Seattle-based photographer, travels all over America, shooting collections, and we'll get into that. Dan's been shooting uh, glass since 2001, and he's the best. So we're honored to have him with us today to answer questions and give a small presentation as well. So the very first question I wanna answer is, Habitat Estates, what is it? Well. Uh, I've named a bunch of services that Habitat's been doing forever, just to clarify uh, what, what part of our business is what. And so Habitat Estates is simply the resale side of Habitat. Um, and it's designed for two sides, which is when collectors offer work on the secondary market, and then we sell work to collectors from those collections, as you guys completely understand. And we've, we've been doing this for, since I've been at the gallery since 2005, We've been offering collections both as single pieces and entire collections. We can maintain one piece, or if you have 300 pieces, we're able to bring the work in in some shape or form and being able to offer it on the market. And it's quite an amazing feat that my predecessors put in place, and I'm kind of working on getting the details down now of, of streamlining it. So we can provide services where we take your collection, give you estimates, what we think the prices would be, organize it for you in a quick um, PDF so you get an idea of what pricing will be across the board or different types of selling, which I'll cover later. Um, we do auctions as well as personal selling and we, we try to meet the demand of work. There's a lot of collectors who are coming up and I'm hoping to find more who missed collecting during certain eras and missed Dominic Labinos and Harvey Littleton and Joel Philip Myers and pieces that were around during the start of the era, which they weren't around to acquire. And the secondary market is great for getting people who want to round out their collections to find these pieces and we're here to help. Um, we have multiple online selling services I'll talk about briefly and a new service called Collections, which is being launched as we speak. Um, online social media and the new uh, service we offer, which is uh, selling work from your home, which is uh, part of the fact we brought Dan Fox in to talk about uh, and we'll talk about that more. So these are some examples of that I can think of off the top of my head when I was putting this presentation together. Sosin Collection, which was a big important collection here in Michigan. Jean Sosin and her husband, his name escapes me. Warren Poole's Collection, the Goldstein Collection out of Wisconsin. Ken and Eleanor Zumke, which people collectors here in Michigan. 
the den, uh, David and Joanne, uh, that here are also Michigan. Uh, Mike, uh, Michael Rubin, another artist, that co another collector that collected in the uh, 80s to 90s. Gilda Birmingham, we sold some of her stuff in the last auction. Uh, Edwin and Mickey Schiff, you probably, you probably know her and her husband. They were collectors here in Michigan and did a lot of the trips. Newer people, we have Alan Burke, who's with us today. Uh, Michael and Annie Belkin, many people know their collection. Uh, we represented them back before, the, before 2010. We did a sale of their work, and now we're getting the rest of their collection soon. Uh, Vic Leo, who's with us today, along with Kathleen. Uh, and a new collection we're getting in is the Robinson, Jack and Aviva Robinson, who are big, important collectors here in Michigan. A lot of their work has been donated. And I can show you uh, that we have, they put together with the DIA a catalog of their work promoting their show at the DAA back in the 90s. And so a lot of their collection that is still available is gonna be coming to us. Um, and then thousands of individual collectors who are selling uh, unique pieces one at a time. So there's good news and bad news today. The good news is there is a demand for secondary work. Um, people out there are looking for pieces and looking for treasures. The bad news is it's currently a buyer's market. A lot of people are selling work and realizing what prices are gonna be and I'm happy that we're able to offer work on the secondary market, but obviously we have to find a medium where the work would sell and not be out of this world. Um, and then on to selling options. So Habitat has a few selling options and they've increased the last few years due to the fact of digital marketing. We do retail floor, floor selling, which you're familiar with. This is kind of on hold at the moment due to COVID-19 and getting together person to person. Uh, personal selling, which I do every day, and I'm currently stationed at my home fortress here in the the basement of the Shea compound where I'm able to reach out and call and talk to people every day and help them uh, help develop people's develop people's collections and focus attention to certain works. Uh, Corey's helping with this and Ferd as well as Regina, our newest sales rep at the gallery. Many of you may have met her at our most recent shows. She's a go-getter. She's really great to work with. Um, we have website retail we're redefining now and uh, which is adding to the collections and collections is new where we're able to sell uh, an entire collection and have the collection online as a collection. So you're able to see a collector's collection if it's available, see their aesthetic, see what they liked and sort through their body of work online and really get a taste of for, for a person's collection when it's available. It's also great if you're the seller, you get to see your collection online, know that there's being efforts to sell the work and you can organize it, direct people there, um, it, and see what has sold and what hasn't. And it's gonna be implemented in the next few weeks here. I have some pictures of it um, in the slideshow that I'm gonna be excited to show as, as it's coming together and becoming a great uh, value in being able to promote artwork. Um, we do physical auctions, which is on hold right now, which are on hold right now due to COVID, but we've done those. We've done them since I think 1993, Ferd told me recently. So we've done them for, for decades now and had great results. Um, Online auctions is becoming more exciting. I've been following it a lot online, following other auction houses. There is a demand. There is, um, clients are usually going out right now, or usually used to going out, used to traveling and spending money on restaurants and shopping. And it hasn't really been happening due to the circumstances of the world. And so this extra um, amount of money that's been sitting on credit cards is being spent in different ways. And one of those ways is artwork. And so, I've been paying attention to auction houses. They haven't been lighting the world on fire, but things have been selling, which is great. And I'm, I'm gonna keep our finger to the pulse of that. And I've talked to Ferd and Corey about this, about doing an auction soon, but we haven't had, had one planned. But I'll go into that later too when I show you uh, the auction we had scheduled for April. You're gonna get a preview here of all the works later on in the presentation. And then um, resale exhibitions. When we have resale work, we take it to art fairs. Uh, or do them online or do them in the gallery. Both are on hold until we get through the current world situations. Um, auctions, briefly, um, when we do an auction, we have an online presence. We do an issue, which is an online catalog. Many of you have seen that, many of you may have not. Um, we use live auctioneers. Um, Artsy.net is a online selling, selling platform you may be aware of, and we're partnering with them to put up artist exhibitions, but we're also gonna be putting up resale exhibitions up there in the future too. We still do printed catalogs. Many of you have those, I hope, all stacked in a nice neat pile from, from years of us doing those. They are a lot of fun to jump back into and explore. And then we do future ones. All work for auctions are posted on habitatglass.com. And then we have a lot of repeat buyers at the gallery who always come back because they know and trust us. 
because we're really great about uh, the work we sell, making sure it's in fine condition and, rep and actual made by the artists that they're made by. Here's a small example of some of the auction catalogs we have done since this is, I think, 2016. So many of you have seen these. Uh, Dan Fox shot all of these pieces for all of the covers, and they turned out really well, and they were we had great results in all these auctions. And some pieces didn't sell, but pieces were purchased after. And most, I went trying to go back into the past and see what pieces were left over from these decades of these uh, years of shows, and there were very, very few, very few. So it, it's great that we have these great results. Um, so back to the collections of offering your collection. These are some of the um, positive things about being able to offer your collection online uh, using our collection service while having it at your home. You can list multiple works. You can do your entire collection at once. You can organize and see your collection that you're wanna be offering. You can see what's sold. You can direct interest, interested parties. You can sell online. One of the great features about this is you get to enjoy the work in your collection until it's sold. It stays right there on the table where you left it until someone has a promise to buy it. And it's a really great opportunity to offer work should you ever get to that point. You also save on shipping because there's no shipping the work into us to hold it until it sells. It's one step less. And there's the URL at the bottom um, that will be up soon. I just pasted it there for reference in the future. All right, this is what estates will look like. There's two collections up at the moment. One of them, Collection C, is the collection that we have online right now of Alan Burke, and Collection M is a private collection. And once you click on these buttons, you're gonna be able to see all the pieces available from that collector on the same page. And you'll see the stones by Jack Schmidt already sold, hence the red dot, while others are still available. And this is a great opportunity to, if you love a piece or you don't love a piece and you're thinking about selling something, this could be an option if you put two or three pieces together, you have your own collections page on our website. Something new, something different, and we're really excited about it because it makes a lot of sense. Now, here's a fun part. So, this is a piece by Eric Hilton. It's available at our gallery. It is a stunning example of work called Spires of Light. And this was a photo of the piece shot by a client. Now, I'm gonna show you another photo in a second shot by Dan Fox comparing value of seeing a, an amazing piece of artwork shot by a professional versus shot by someone like me. This is the unprofessional shot. This is Dan Fox's shot. Same exact piece. It is, I would say, 100 million times better looking at what Dan can do to make the work really show up to its potential. And I'm going to throw it over to Dan Fox now, and we're going to get a small presentation on what he can do um, and uh, his uh, abilities and services. So I'm going to kick it over to you right now, Dan. I'm going to pin you. Okay, can I share my screen then? And I'm, give me one second to um, unpin you, and then I'm going to, yeah, go ahead and share your screen, see if it works. Um, right now, it's saying that uh, attendee uh, screen sharing is disabled. Oh, let me get, make you the uh, make the host. Then, oh, I forgot about that. All right, now try it. Okay, good. You're not seeing it, Dan. Hang on a second. Okay, there we go. We're looking at your screen. Oh, uh, what are you what are you seeing right now? We see your Photoshop screen with no images. Right oh, now. okay. Okay, that I was expecting an OK button, so I didn't get it just automatically. Did it? Yep, you're um, already on. All right. Well, let me uh, let me just briefly introduce myself. Uh, Dan Fox here. I've been um, I'm mean, here in, in, uh, uh, on an island, actually. We just uh, finished a house on Anderson Island in the Puget Sound. It's a little north of Olympia. And I have a studio in Seattle proper um, that I've uh, been maintaining since I arrived here about 11 years ago. Um, just a little briefly about me, context. I've been uh, shooting professionally almost my entire adult career. Um, started the studio in the mid 80s and it's run continuously um, since then. Um, generally, there are two kinds of uh, photographers, broadly speaking. People who, uh, who shoot, um, photographers who shoot people and photographers who shoot objects. I'm obviously uh, on the object side. Um, I sort of gravitated that way because I like to have a lot of control. Um, 
if you're shooting architecture or people, there are lots of moving parts and you can't always, you know, be efficient with the project. You have to wait for the right light, and that kind of thing. So that desire for control uh, sort of pushed me, uh, motivated me to develop techniques that since I would say the early 90s when uh, desktop uh, photography became available, uh, where I can really control everything about the shot. So what it means is these techniques then become ideally suited for location work. Uh, we don't need big studios. Um, it's relatively non-intrusive to, uh, to you know, the client. Uh, and really anything can be shot anywhere without making big sets or having it be a big production. So it's a pretty, a pretty painless process. Um, let me see here. Um, I would just say as, as background, when you look at, uh, I'm gonna show you uh, uh, briefly a few photographs and talk about them. Um, Aaron, can they ask questions during this time? Yeah, anybody can unplug themselves and ask, unmute themselves and ask questions at any time. Okay, great. Feel free to ask questions, uh, whatever occurs to you at any time. Um, people, uh, especially with uh, uh, amateurs and people who are shooting uh, people, kinds of things, weddings and so forth, um, they often refer to it as taking a picture or capturing an image. That's not what this is about. Uh, this is more about constructing the image. So we're making very deliberate uh, decisions about the piece. Uh, and I consult with the owners, uh, people whose collections they are, what, you know, try to find out something about their relationship to the piece, what drew them to the piece initially. Uh, I shoot for a lot of artists and we have long discussions about the, their intent for a piece. And what we're trying to make is the strongest, simplest statement of the piece. Um, that really grabs the attention uh, of the viewer and shows maybe the strongest you know, features of the piece. So there's a lot of discussion about intent and you know what the piece uh, will, will give us. Now a lot of people you know look around their collections and say you know how can this happen? Uh, they're in pieces that are in niches. They're large. They're up against a wall, up against a window. Um, not really what you would conventionally think of as suited for photography. So people have in their heads the idea of big sets. Uh, all those concerns are really uh, by the board. Uh, they don't really apply. Uh, large pieces don't need to be moved. Um, anything under say 30 pounds, something like that can be moved to uh, a small set in the home. Uh, where it just makes it more convenient, uh, you know, to shoot. So you're not moving the lights all around. So- Dan, may, may yeah. I interrupt for just a second? Sure. Is there supposed to be an image on my screen? Not right I now, have... not right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, the, coming soon. Um, it's just me talking for another second or two. So anyway, just keep in mind that uh, you might imagine, you know, uh, if you were thinking about having this done in your home, or the way I work is I can go into a warehouse, I can go into a home and imagine the room totally dark, okay? And someone having a, a light source where we can pick out the piece and it doesn't matter where it is. Um, all of that tech, all of those technical digital tools are available to us and so uh, anything can be shot really anywhere with a minimum of fuss. And that's where the efficiency comes in and, and where uh, the, the uh, estates from habitat uh, scenario comes in. All right, let's take a look at, at I just wanna give you a, a brief um, feeling for the kinds of things we're gonna, some of these things you have seen and others will be less familiar. Was that a flash quiz? See how many we can identify? I'm sorry? I said, was that a flash quiz to see how many we could identify? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, how many did you get? <laughs> but I can't remember right now. <laughs> All of them, probably, right? Okay. Um, obviously, a Stankard. Uh, the, the, the thing to, uh, I think, that's salient about this one 
is you, can everybody see this cursor that I'm rotating on the, on the image? Yep, we can see it. Okay, see that negative space right there on the top? Because of the yep. way this is constructed, um, you're getting refracted mirror images all the way around. And the position of the camera is crucial here. So you, this refracted mirror image doesn't touch the top of this blossom. Okay. So all of these things are really, um, there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of very uh, precise placement of lighting and so forth. The other thing too is you don't want to get a lot of reflection uh, and uh, from the light sources. So all the lights are, you know, independently controlled. So we get a, uh, a uh, sort of a spotlight effect highlighting the heart of the piece. Yeah, and was this was this piece shot like on a coffee table? How was it shot? Like, what was it shot on? Do you remember? Uh, I can't remember what it was shot on, but it, uh, generally smaller items uh, are shot on just a white paper, plain white gotcha. paper, in order to capture the shadow. Every element of all these shots is independent, okay, of the other ones. So in, in other words, the background is computer generated. The piece is a composite image of maybe six or seven different shots. Uh, you can see the modeling of, of the uh, cactus on the left side here and a modeling on the right side. Those are two independent lights, but you don't see them, uh, you know, the reflections or anything uh, in the final image. It's just something I can brush in, so I have total control over it. The shadow, too, is completely independent. So you've got the background, the piece, and all the compositing that goes on in the piece, and the shadow itself. They're all independently controllable. So this, I have some samples of this later on in the, in the presentation, where we can take all of these elements and, for example, this thing could be put into a cloud background, or I could change, change the surface that it's on to any substrate, you know, we want. Could be concrete, wood, marble, whatever we want. So there's really total control. And when you get to this point, uh, then it becomes a very versatile image to use for a variety of purposes. You could strip this thing out, okay, the piece itself, retain the shadow, and put it into, uh, say, American Craft, okay, as an example of a, uh, if they're doing an article on Stankard. Um, very, cool. very cool. Can you show us some more examples, uh, Dan? Sure, we can go through here. Um, okay, here's a Singletary. And the same things apply here. This, this negative space, I love where the, the um, the wing, if you will, just barely is a hovering above the surface that it's on. And it's just, it, to me, this is a key area in this thing. And, and the position of the camera is, again, crucial um, to, to give it some life. And it's not just sitting there. Uh, the other thing to look at here is the local contrast. We've got good local contrast between this face and this arm, good local contrast within this arm. And then the heart of the piece literally is glowing. So Dan is able to take them to work and make it look potentially its best using this multiple image format and then having it floating to modify whatever background is needed, usually in a very uh, minimal background to make the piece pop. This is Preston Singletary? Yes. Beautiful. Here's a Salvatore piece. Again, these are all, these are all composites. Uh, and we're trying to get, you know, good texture here and then light coming through the back of these things, which frequently you'll see uh, other photographs of these where they'll get one or the other, but with these, uh, with the control that the digital techniques have um, or afford us, we can control that everything. This is how it turned. Now, these, I believe, are shot in uh, Habitat's warehouse in Royal Oak. And uh, if you've ever been in the warehouse, uh, you'll realize that this is kind of magical because there is. There are crates everywhere. And this is probably sitting on top of a crate, on top of a white card. Uh, this one uh, is a rainy, and, and it is particularly, uh, it's one that I really, really like because the world that's going on inside the Coke bottle would n is not achievable conventionally, okay? The Coke bottle itself is very opaque. It's really, it, you know, there's not a lot of light coming through it. So in order to get these highlights to model the form inside here and create that world, that's definitely a part of the piece. I'm blasting light through behind it, okay, 
with uh, on one of the files. Everything else is blown out, overexposed, except for these areas here. So I can do both worlds, the exterior um, uh, iconography and then this interior world, which is key to the piece. It would not have been possible with conventional photography. Um, it's a nice pizer. I like this because it's, uh, it's immediately dramatic and it's a very small piece. So what the intent here is, is to, is to draw the viewer in to a smaller piece and they might miss the details and the, the real, you know, precision that's in the piece and to make it a little more dramatic. So we've got, you know, the shadowing down here and so forth. Another Pizer, classically difficult to shoot because of all the faceting and the interior reflections. Each one of those uh, reflective panels can be independently controlled as well as the background and the shadowing and so forth. Uh, this is Quantum Leap, it's Paul Manners. And uh, I think this is the best shot of it I've ever seen because we can control everything. Each one of these facets is uh, independently controllable, both in color and clarity and so forth. So uh, yeah, I love cat color cast shadows. It's a part of you know what draws me to shooting glass. And, and the ability to control all of these facets without any highlights that we don't want. Um, you know, it makes it a joy to work with these pieces. Yeah, can you show us some of your process shots now? We're kind of uh, got to get uh, a short time oh, here for this video. Yeah, I could, I could go on for a long time, sure. Um, okay, this is uh, pretty typical. This is a, a, a really nice room here on the right with a Michael Taylor on a pedestal. And the one on the left is the finished shot. Um, and it was shot on that pedestal, correct? Yeah, it was shot on the pedestal. Gotcha. Here is a, a, a large scale piece, okay? And you can see me in here, okay? This is in a typical uh, situation with uh, a collector's home uh, with, you know, profusion of, you know, our objects around flowers and so forth. And this is the, this is where it lives normally. And so you can see it's a big piece. Uh, it's a Marlene Rose and it's probably weighs a couple hundred pounds. You don't want to move it. And we don't need to move it. Okay, so this is what this is kind of what the piece looks like. Okay. Here's one. I'm holding the light here. Uh, the camera is locked down on a tripod and you can see in this image, okay, here's the light source. I've got an iPad on a on a, on my belt. So the iPad controls the camera, which then controls this light wirelessly. So all these things are battery operated. There's no lights or there's no wires, you know, none of that stuff. And I can move around the house pretty freely uh, and really not, you know, bother anything. And then here's the... Gang? Yes. Do you work alone or do you have an assistant with you? Usually work alone. Uh, I will bring someone if it requires that we, we need to do uh, a lot of moving. Like a lot of, a lot of times these pieces are up in niches, okay? And the smaller pieces, say under 30 pounds, need to be brought down, okay, to where we can work with them. Um, the bigger pieces we don't move at all because it's, it's way too much hassle and it's generally unnecessary and they're closer to the ground. But if they're up high, so if there is a, a need for it, it generally it works out to where I can do uh, about four an hour by myself. So the days are usually between nine and 10 hours. I mean, I'm there to shoot, right? So I uh, try to be efficient and they're long working days. I have uh, worked with Dan too, to speed him up a bit, helping him out moving pieces around if needed. So it's a lot of fun to see. Very little, don't, don't, don't let him fool you, very little. <laughs> uh, and here's another one. Uh, this is where the piece lives. Okay, and, and frequently these, these uh, the pieces, this is the Peter Hora, um, and it's, you know, it's in a great spot, but because it, it, it's, it could be moved, but I don't want to move. My, my philosophy is to handle the art as little as possible. So uh, you can see the mullions through the piece, and the pieces are frequently, that have transparency, are frequently in front of windows. 
so people can see their uh, see that aspect of it in normal life but it's not great for photography so here is another sample it's a classic technique i'm holding a white card behind it and then controlling the camera through the ipad and getting the light through it and here's the here's the final image the image is a composite um, basically it's probably six or seven different shots and everything's in register the piece gets outlined and then i you know we pick and choose in the studio so it's a reason it can go very quickly i'm not creating a finished image on site i'm creating i'm getting i'm shooting enough that i'm covered and then in the studio i go in and you know have a, a coffee and put my feet up and then ponder it for a while uh, the interesting thing about this is the reflection this isn't, I couldn't get a white card under here. Um, and the reflection is not exactly what you would, what um, you would get with this technique, which is just flipping it. Actually had to imagine what the reflection would be like. You wouldn't be seeing the top of the base, for example. So I've cut it out. So there's, there, there are a number of, you know, uh, details that I have to be cognizant of when I'm doing this. So, Beyond the catalog, okay, there are um, things to be done. I mean, uh, there are a lot of reasons to do this. Uh, ma mainly, and, and the purpose of this meeting is uh, a, an auction catalog. Um, but uh, you would also want to use these files if you were going to donate the uh, collection to a museum. Uh, museums don't want to make catalogs. It's expensive, and they generally don't have anybody on staff that's very good. I mean. Um, and it's uh, what they want to do is curate. Okay, that's what museums do. Uh, so if you can give them a great catalog, the great images, all they have to do is do what they do best, which is curate. And it makes it makes the transition from your your home to them a lot easier. It may be even possible. Uh, also, insurance. If the collection looks better, you'll probably have less hassle if something happens in convincing people who probably don't know anything about glass. Uh, to take this seriously. It's not just a hunt for glass, you know. Uh, it's real art and it's really valuable. Um, and the other thing is books. Okay, and the layouts I'm gonna show you here are, are book layouts. And books basically are legacy items. It, it's a way for you to document collections at their height. I mean, these are, you know, works of, uh, you know, pursuits of passion over the decades. And it allows succeeding generations, your grandkids, to know what you were about, you know, and, and the things that were important to you. So uh, here is a, a wonderful layout. Works really well with uh, with uh, Leah Wingfield and her husband. I guess it's her husband. Uh, this is a, a 12 by 12. So this is a 24 inch spread. The book is 12 by 12, and so this is a very dramatic, you know, uh, I think beautiful uh, a layout that really flows beautifully unless the pieces speak. Uh, here is a, a Morris. And uh, again, a 12, a 12 by 24 layout. And the reason these things are sort of, one has a background, dark background, the other doesn't. The dark background allows us to see the, the detail of this translucency of this prong here. And the reversed side of this piece, because it is two-sided, uh, tends to, with a, with a white background, tends to uh, reveal the form more. Uh, also, you can see how this shadow can be removed from a darker background. Both of these photographs can be completely the same, but in the studio, uh, we can change it depending on how we want the layout to be. Here's another Morris. Um, yeah, all of these pieces, this is the square cut. The dark background shows the translucency, these beautiful details up above where the light's coming through. And all of these things are done with uh, uh, lights directly behind the piece because they're very opaque, but I wanted to get them to glow. And without these digital techniques, this is impossible to do in a, in a, in a the shot as you would see it. This, the lights would conflict with each other. Um, and I think this is a very beautiful layout. It just flows nicely. 
here's Lino. Uh, and we really wanted the forms and the color to look good in this one. So it's nice and clean, beautiful color. Here's a uh, Sigler. These cones are beautiful in themselves. Uh, there's lots of nice dynamics going on here between the, the, the straight lines and the, and the ellipses in the pieces themselves. Um, these two pieces work well together. This, um, again, this seam, this shape really sits in the page beautifully. Lots of great negative space that emphasizes the flow of uh, the Boyajo. The Grutens is a favorite of mine. Uh, this is actually where it is in the house. Um, I wanted it to glow. So it's like, it's on a pedestal that has a light underneath it, but I didn't use any of it. The difficulty with the Grutens is you don't want to show too much of the, the uh, layering, but still see the filaments. So I wanted this thing to have light pouring out of it. Okay, and I think having uh, it in situ helps with that. And we can see all the details, you know, on the sides and so forth. Again, this would be completely impossible to do with conventional photography. It's a very pretty uh, preliminary layout for uh, Bothwell. And here we can, you know, this is pretty much studio on the left. Uh, and on the right, we introduce some clouds because, you know, such a beautiful, you know, pastel kind of palette. Is Bohus and Bettison. And uh, a lot of, when I was growing up, people used to uh, take this image, for example, and make it the large image, and then the detail would be smaller. I think it's backwards. I would rather have people, when they turn the page, fall in love with the piece. And I think in any printed piece, that's what's key. Here's the detail. I want the viewer to love it, give them an emotional reason. And then, you know, if necessary, show them the whole piece and they get the idea of what the thing is about. And here's a nice one. I think it's a, a very strong, this, this pedestal is actually in the home. Uh, they have a number of uh, these Bennett horse heads. Um, and the decision was made, instead of showing all of them, to make this one, you know, very fine example, um, really sing. And in this kind of context, uh, the monochromatic aspect of it really works well with the, with the, uh, the name up above. Um, and it, it, it sits in the page very nicely. This is, this is great stuff, Dan. I appreciate you sharing this with us today. Sure. And uh, this is a great uh, visualization of how you work and and giving people an idea of what can be done in their homes to create beautiful photos. Would you give me the uh, hosting back, please, sir? Sure, how do I do it? Clicking on my face and the, on the buttons and making it say make host, we did this yesterday. Ah, uh, there you go. All right, thank you. I'm gonna take over the screen, okay. go back to our presentation. You're looking at the full page. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, we're going to look at some available work on the secondary market just to get an idea of what's out there. And obviously, you're welcome to look at the resale page at Habitat.com. Many of you have seen this Oban Bright piece. This was scheduled for our auction. It didn't happen in April. It is available. It is a beautiful uh, mold-blown mold piece by Obrin. And at 22 inches tall, a great example of his work. Uh, Alex Bernstein, Diverge 2. Uh, this is available on the secondary market, a beautiful, stunning work. This is out of the collections. This is currently at a home available for sale, 27 inches tall. Simon Maberly, Untitled. Uh, many of you have seen this mannequin-like work. It's uh, beautiful. It's very um, interesting work, the way these things are all mounted together. We've sold, I think, two or three of them at auction, and this one is available through the gallery. Uh, Lubinsky free through. We've taken multiple pictures of this piece, but Dan shot it the best. Uh, it is a, it is a uh, masterpiece. It is one of my favorite of the Lubinskys. Yeah, and it, it is uh, it is available at the gallery, and you're welcome to come carry it out of there. <laughs> Interesting, Michael Glancy. All these are basically all shot by Dan, so I'll stop saying that. 
and wall mounted uh, Michael Glancy piece, very interesting, very different, eight by eight inches. Uh, Dale Chihuly Machia series, a large um, collection by Dale, uh, beautiful pheasant Machia, and it has a purple you can't really see on the outside in this particular photo, but you can kind of see it on the pieces on the inside. Uh, Floras, a Cassandria Blackmore wall mounted piece, green in color. She does these by hand painting them and hitting them with a hammer and watching the glass shatter and, and uh, spread. And uh, I love her work. She's great. She Aaron, has, how do I find these on your website? So I'll get into that, but they're on the resale page on our site. Got it. Show you exactly how to do it, but in a, in a few, because I have pictures for people how to do it, but you can click on artist and click on resale. Uh, oh, cool. uh, David Bennett, there's a beautiful David Bennett horse available, 32 inches wide, probably one of the nicest I've seen. I've seen some with three heads, some with one, and this one is a masterpiece. Uh, Rick Beck Lotus, another piece of uh, sell from the collections, uh, comes with a stand and it's a beautiful example of his work. 70 inches tall with the stand. Classic uh, Herb Babcock. I love these works. They can go outside. Many of you are familiar with Herb's work. Many of you have his work. Uh, we just recently had a very small, tiny one come in and Nolan uh, Young, uh, who is the son of Elbert Young, bought it from the galley for his own personal collection, which is very, very fun keeping. Sometimes artists collect other artists. And this is a massive piece at uh, 26.5 inches wide, 23 inches tall, and it's just immaculate. Uh, Peter Hora, Linda piece available through collections. Beautiful, beautiful work. It has, it lights up very well from behind. Uh, I actually had a conversation with Lucas Hora saying this is a very rare form piece uh, done by his father. And his father was even considering buying it back because he doesn't have one like this for his collection, but it is still available at the moment. Uh, Masayo Odahashi. Um, a Japanese artist. She's actually working on a commission for me of five of these right now for a client. Um, this is an individual piece uh, for sale from uh, an, a local local art, local collector. And uh, it's just a beautiful little piece, peaceful piece. L uh, John Wood, um, local artist here in Michigan. Beautiful work from a private collection as well called Star Touch Malo. Um, interesting color in this piece of work. And I have more images if anybody's interested but it's all cast in just a very powerful piece. Do all right, here's the, here we go, Howard. Here's the finding the resale page. I got it right here. So on our page, there's, if you can see my mouse, they call this a hamburger, which is three little buttons in the upper right-hand corner. And a lot of our services are buried under this button. And if you click it, all these things appear that are available on our website. So one of them is a resale, you can see there, which is easy to find. So if you keep it, don't have it right there, right, these little buttons, these will open up lots of options. The other options, if you click on artist right here, it will drag open to artist resale. You click resale, and this is what the resale page looks like. You can see all of these available pieces right now available on Habitat's resale page. Um, soon, not yet, but soon there will be a collections buttons button that will sort uh, available work via collection. If there's a collection that has more than, I think, three pieces, you'll be able to view in case you like the taste of that collector, you can actually see other work available that that, artist sele that collector selected over time. So, but this is an example of what the resale page look like, looks like. You can click on the hamburger, click resale, or click on artist and click resale and see uh, available work. And if you have an individual piece you wanted to sell, once it's photographed, they can go up here as well for people to, to peruse and look at. Um, Today, on a different note, we launched our Latches or Voyage of Limited called the Fourth Dimension, which is a small uh, piece he's making that's an addition that throws back to his series of optical glass. And he's making these out of his studio uniquely, and they're available at habitat.com under the limited button. And if you're considering uh, work collecting pieces from our limited, this is a great one. He's working on these now. They're working on making these now in his studio in California. And it's all about how he feels We've all been trapped inside of our own cubes for the last few months, and it really got him the drive to make something. So feel free to check that out.
Okay, so here is the wrap up. This was the auction we had scheduled for April, which never happened due to coronavirus. So I wanted to give everybody here a preview of this particular show so you can get an idea of what it would have been like and then we will modify this in the future for a future auction. That being said, all these works are available and I'm looking forward to talking about them with anybody interested. The front page is a John Kuhn, was very cool, but you'll see this piece at the end of the auction. So an older Richard Marquis teapot, um, a beautiful example of the work. Old, so many Marinis on it, but there's always a demand for these teapots. Mark Pizer, another example, a beautiful piece, very geometric. All these photos were shot by Dan Fox, so this also gives you an idea of his talent. Uh, beautiful Michael Glancy. I love uh, Michael's work. I've always I've talked to him constantly about what's going on in his life and uh, work that he has available. His prices are very expensive, so it's always fun to offer these pieces in the secondary market because they're not usually as expensive as they are. But you know, they show a different era than what he's working on more recently. Another piece by Glancy. And if you ever see a Glancy, it usually has three parts to it. A vessel and a base. And if you're missing the base, then you're missing a part of the piece. So make sure that you have the bases when you find Glancy in the secondary market. Yeah. A proper piece. It's on the website. Um, very, very fun. I don't know much about David Hopper. I have a lot to learn, but we've offered his work in the past. Uh, Harry Littleton, a nice work from this, from the, I think it was from the probably early 80s. Uh, another great example of his work that will be available in the future. Doug Anderson, we've sold uh, maybe about six or seven of his pieces since I've started at auction. A pate ver, very simple piece with a fish on the side. He's known for frog teeter-totters and different elements of uh, life and, and aquatic life. Uh, really great Robin Greeby. Uh, I love her work, I love Robin and she's slowed down now recently as an artist, but I love seeing her work in the secondary market and we've done well with her over time. And if anybody likes to see something later, I can always send you an image in better quality. This is a very large Davide Salvadori. I think it's maybe like 60 inches tall, yellow and carved. It's a, it's a masterpiece by Davide. Del Chihuly, a fun two part red with black lip wrap sculpture. Very fun, probably would be priced right for our auctions. Mary Schaffer, I love Mary, she's, she's a trip and she makes some beautiful things. We have her in our Glass 48 exhibition. Obviously we offer her on the secondary market as well. Oh, there's the Babcock again, I guess we can skip that one now. Um, Ken Carter, he just recently retired, I saw on Facebook, he posted that he was retiring from making glass. We sold his work primarily as far as I know since I've been around on the secondary market, but he's made some very beautiful things. And this is a two part piece. It stacks on top of itself and uh, has quite a present. This was from the collection of Gilda Birmingham, so it's gotta be early 80s. Mark Pizer, this goes along with what Dan Fox was showing earlier. Uh, a beautiful Mark Pizer shot extremely well, and these are always in demand. These, these wheat pieces are uh, flowered pieces from uh, Mark Pizer, and I have a small one in my collection, paperweight that I got at our last auction because I'm a huge fan of Mark Pizer's work. This is a great David Hutchhausen. Notice that the color on the bottom is blue while the color in the piece is yellow. And so this was part of the fun that David got obsessed with when he made these is somehow, I can't tell you how it works, when the light hits the top of the piece, it actually has a different color that reflects through the piece than the piece itself. And we've sold probably about maybe five of these tables since I worked at the gallery. And I didn't notice this until the last two, someone told me about this. And then I talked to David about it. He told me about it as well. And they're very exciting pieces because it's something you don't see every day. And David put a lot of thought into these works. And we have this one available and I'm gonna have another one coming um, later on from the Robinson collection. This is a great piece. This is a full size thermostatum table. And the clients have enjoyed this for years and they're downsizing. And this, I don't, I'm not sure how we're gonna get it here yet. Rob has a plan but it is available in the secondary market. And I think it's just wonderful, beautiful colors. And they used it as, I'm guessing a, 
a table they don't use. Um, it's actually in the dining room. Dining room, right? And it's it's a uh, it's a wonderful piece. Aaron. Yeah. Can you speak to its size at all? Um, yes, I have that information. Give me one second to switch to my uh, PDF right here, and I'll look for it. It is here. It is. It is seventy-two inches in in length, thirty inches tall, or thirty-eight thirty inches tall, thirty-eight inches deep. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, an older John Kuhn. Um, looks like this one is wall mounted from his series before the series most of you know. Um, Corey familiarized me with this series when I first started at the gallery because I was so used to his other series of the cut and polished glass. So this is a, a step he took towards to what he creates today. And I've never seen one wall mounted before. Uh, beautiful Barry Sautner and uh, he's I'm a big fan of his work. He passed in 2009 and this was a Holocaust piece. Uh, which Barry created back in the day and it was sold to somebody who passed away and the spouse has no longer the ability to keep the collection. So we have it on consignment at the gallery. It is a magnificent piece, barbed wire call, carved all around it. It's a very powerful, powerful work. And if you look in the dead center of it, you can see a skull um, and, and Nazi symbols around the green glass. It's a very powerful, powerful work. Judith Scola. I know she's been traveling a lot lately, um, getting, uh, not experience, but getting, going through experiences, getting some more interesting ideas. A beautiful work of hers. I think this is about 28 inches tall. Steve Lynn, um, not very often we get work of his in the secondary market. This is in the gallery. I had it photographed by Dan last time he was visiting us. Um, I wish I knew more about it. If you're interested, let me know. It looks like these are different artists that paint. And I should probably have done more research, but it's a beautiful it's um, huge. example of his work, right? It's really large, isn't it, Dan? I say it's about five feet wide. About five feet wide. Um, for those of you that know Brent Key Young's cage work, before he did that, he did these vessel forms. Um, we placed a couple since I've been at the gallery. I know the Imagine Museum has acquired three of them from us. The interior is usually a solid color, and they're artifact-esque on the outside. These are great historic pieces if you love Brent Key Young in his work. A very interesting Harvey Littleton, um, three different segments of clear glass. I've never quite seen one like this before. Um, I think it was made in 77, and um, I would have guessed it would have been a different artist, but down to the facts, it is Harvey Littleton. Joel Philip Myers, we've done well with these um, uh, this series in the past, and uh, beautiful colors on this particular piece, and it will be available through the gallery. Another interesting Harvey Littleton, a loop series. It looks like an older one, probably 1980. Um, large and blue, and uh, a great example of Harvey's work. This is an extremely large uh, Richard Jolly piece, all in black. This has got to be about 40 inches tall. Would you say, Dan, you shot that? Yes. Yeah, and it's, it's a great example of uh, his work. And it, you have to see this one in person. And it'll be scheduled for future sale. Ann Wolf. Uh, vessel, vessel form, very subtle example of a work probably from the 80s as well. I personally have a piece of this series in my collection. I, I just love Ann Wolf. Uh, Jack Schmidt, this is what Jack did before Jack did Jack Schmidt's. And this is probably in the 80s as well. And I love this series, very, very clean, very, very clear. And I, I have a plan to offer another one uh, larger than this later on in uh, a future auction. Seth Randall. Many of you are familiar with his work, cast glass, very, very big pieces. We sold in our last auction. This one is also available. Flora Mace, Joy Kirkpatrick, these line pieces. Um, there's always a demand for these. People seem to love this kind of work. I think they're very fun. They usually have a great history to them. Uh, Sydney Cash, these are absolutely great historic pieces. I love seeing these in people's collections. It just shows uh, the highlight of an era when people were making glass and then sending it out and showing what it's capable of in a different way. These are very dangerous to ship. So I hope whoever buys this someday will pick it up locally or we'll figure it out. Martin Blank, large scale. I think this is about 38 inches tall, single piece, uh, all clear glass. A very beautiful, powerful work that we have in the galley for resale. Craig Callenberger, 
these are very, very fun. We've sold a few of these at auction. I think Dan's probably shot about six of them since we started working with him. Yes. Um, they're all di made differently. They all have unique traits. And these are uh, a segment series, I believe, and they're just they're wonderful pieces. Um, Owen Braden, a lot of people may know him. He's an artifact artist. He makes some beautiful things. And this was a piece we had at auction probably maybe the early, maybe 2019, January that was passed. It's still available. I, I just love this piece. And it's, I believe it's called like a water dragon or something. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very substantial piece. It's quite large, six feet tall. So it's nice to see things of that scale. Berto Valine, um, everybody's familiar with Berto's work. We have pieces on the first market from him and on the secondary market. An amazing piece of the artist's work and available at the gallery. Uh, William Carlson, we have two. Um, this is an older series that he worked on. People are familiar with this kind of series. Or they're probably more familiar with his wall series, which we have also at the gallery, multiple panels that mounts to a wall. This one is also available. Um, back to the Oven, you guys have seen that already. Another Dale Jahuli, black, very, very peaceful, beautiful piece. And I um, want to share, it looks like it's four parts. Uh, Dominic Libido Emergence, his most well-known work, most in demand. The prices of these have fluctuated up and down. One of the first pieces I sold was a Libino at the gallery on the secondary market. And it's always, he always has a great part in my heart because of his story and how well, he's tied into the, the original story of the studio glass movement. Uh, Zora Polova, a large uh, installation piece. This is probably 80 inches tall. We have this in our storage right now at the gallery, available for sale in the secondary market. Uh, Richard Ritter, a uh, beautiful example of Richard's work. I'm a big fan of Richard. Went to his studio to visit him I went in my youth, and I own a piece of his in my, per my collection as well, just because I'm a big fan of his. It's available. Howard Bentray, we all know Howard, uh, cast work, very powerful presence. Uh, it's probably about 28 to 30 inches tall. Marvin Lepofsky, another legend. His work travels throughout the secondary market. This form is pretty well known and available in the secondary market. Another Richard Ritter, I found this one quite beautiful with the butterfly, very peaceful. I think it's only about six inches tall. Joel Philip Myers, another example different glass entirely instead of the black the blue form usually a little more rare and quite nice and then the John Kuhn at the end of my presentation and uh, another example of John's current style of work a masterpiece in itself and available at the gallery so let me close stop sharing my screen and get back to us and I, uh, I'm glad everybody could join us today and check out some of the stories uh, if you have any questions you're welcome to ask me or contact me later we can also talk about how the gallery works financially, percentage sales for uh, auction versus retail. So you're welcome to email me about that. We can talk about that uh, as well. Same thing with working with Dan Fox. If you're interested in le learning about how he works and coming to your area and rates, I can connect you directly with Dan at any time. I also want to uh, mention also Depth Gallery often is Debbie and Samantha. They're always there too to answer questions and help um, with all kinds of plans that we have to do with shipping and questions about artwork. Both of them have sold things in the past constantly, so they're both available as well as Regina and I. So feel free to contact any of us. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Feel free to ask any questions. Dan, you want to say something? Yeah, just, just a, a little bit. If, you, uh, if anyone would like a personal reference from people who have shot with me before, that's available. You can have a following conversation with me. Yes, there are a few people online and they're welcome to speak up. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Um, I also want to mention this real quick is we have an estates package we send out and it is a folder with basically our plan for resale. So you get a physical copy in your hand. If you ever want a copy of this, we have plenty at the gallery. Just gives you an example of like examples of the auction catalogs we've done and other details about our process. And it's something that we're uh, trying to streamline so people have a quick, easy access way of knowing what to do personally, or if your estate has to deal with your collection, the answers are in here. That's great. Well, thank you all for joining uh, today, and I appreciate your time. I went a little bit over, um, but I thank you all for joining us today. And if you have any questions, ask away. Aaron, I'd like to add a quick thing, sure. if, I, if I may. I apologize that there's no video. 
um, on my screen here, but I wanted to mention uh, Charles Shepard is on here somewhere. Right here beside you, Corey. Uh, Charles um, has developed uh, quite a nice collection over there at the museum and um, over there at Fort Wayne in Indiana. And if, if resale is not an option, you'd like to donate. Uh, he is open to review uh, donations uh, of, of work as they're building a collection. So uh, please uh, reach out to, to Charles if you may. If not, you can get a hold of him through our gallery. Um, if not, uh, look up Fort Wayne, um, look up the museum in Fort Wayne, and uh, uh, I really hope that you, uh, you even get a chance to check out that museum. Well, thank, thank, you. thank you, Corey, and uh, I, I will tell you that uh, with Corey and Aaron's help, the museum in the last seven years has gone from having no glass in the collection to having about uh, 65 or 70 pieces. I was uh, with a collector uh, from Habitat Gallery last night in a Zoom, and he's committed uh, 10 new pieces, which I'm very excited about. And Aaron, I have to ask, if, if we are all wound up about some of the pieces you have shown today, how do we find out how to buy them? Because you're making me have shopping fever. <laughs> Just email me or call me anytime, guys. I'm stationed in my home base here at, at home and I'm available to talk anytime. So feel free to reach out to me if you saw anything you like or think you saw something you like. Um, the pieces that were scheduled for auction are a little bit tricky because the clients who wanted to sell them were at auction, but I'm sure they're always up for to talking and negotiation, anything else. I also wanted to mention that um, with Dan Fox's idea of photographing your legacy, there is a service we, we're advising through Habitat.com, which is called Habitat Generations, which I may have talked to you about before, but it's simply um, going through your collection and sharing your story about each piece and writing it down and, and including it in your paperwork um, and having it in a physical form so they don't have to, someone doesn't have to pull the story out of your head every time. And doing this kind of thing where you have photos that go along with your story helps build the, build the legacy. And if your family members or anybody wants the pieces in your collection to remember you by or to have to enjoy forever, that's even better than giving to me for resale. I want first and foremost to, for artwork to stay in your family of people who care about what you care about. But if for some reason that the work ends up in my hands, I'm happy to work with you to find a new home for every piece so someone else can enjoy it. So. That's, that's the whole shabeel. So I appreciate everybody coming today. And if you have any more questions, I'm available. I don't have a question, but for two cents, I would say that Dan shot my collection is a whole lot different than walking up with your cell phone and taking pictures. <laughs> and once Dan is done with it, then the work just begins. He goes back to his bat cave and spends a lot of time converting the individual images into a composite piece. And it's just worth working with somebody who knows glass. When you start yeah. talking. Thank you, Alan. I wanted to say something about Dan uh, as well. He's done three pieces. The treat is watching him work. <laughs> you know? uh, if you've not seen him, actually, how he studies the piece, how he moves around, how he moves his iPad, it's a marvel. It's a real treat. Uh, I know the end product, I know that the end product is going to come out fabulous, but actually watching him watch your piece is an exciting little uh, sidebar. That's Dan. <laughs> the fun part, I think, for everybody is to, they get a chance to revisit the piece through, uh, through my eyes. And, you know, they've had these pieces for a long time. And, you know, it's nice to go back and, and rediscover them. Why is this saying you? Dan, I want say that Dan shot our collection uh, both in Denver and Arizona and he's just a pleasure to work with uh, and very very accommodating so if you're thinking of wanting uh, a, a legacy for your collection don't hesitate to call him he's great thanks Judy yeah that's great. Yep. So yeah, there's uh, two people speaking up for Dan, and that's why we trust him as well to, to take our shots to the gallery. And we're honored to have him, and I'm glad he was able to join us today. It was a pleasure. It's great working with you. Thank you, Dan. Well, I appreciate all your time today. I don't want to take up any more.
enjoy yourselves today. Hopefully it's beautiful around you guys. It's decent around us in Michigan. So have a great weekend and I'll hope to see you all next week. Wow, thank you, Aaron. Bye, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Dan. See you guys. Be safe.